In 2 Chronicles 12 to 14, the narrative unfolds with the reigns of Rehoboam, Abizah, and Asa, kings of Judah. Join us for a historical journey marked by challenges, warfare, and moments of faithfulness as these kings navigate the complexities of leadership and their relationships with God. Last time, we witnessed the visit of the Queen of Sheba to Solomon, drawn by the fame of his wisdom and the splendor of his kingdom. Solomon openly shared the source of his wisdom, attributing it to God's gift. The Queen was astonished by Solomon's wisdom, the grandeur of his kingdom, and the offerings he made at the house of the Lord, which symbolized the burnt offering pointing to Christ. The Queen of Sheba expressed her amazement and acknowledged the God of Israel as the one who set Solomon on the throne for the well-being of his people. Her journey to witness Solomon's wisdom and approach to God demonstrated her faith and determination to verify the reports she had heard. This Gentile Queen praised the happiness of Solomon's servants and blessed the Lord for his love towards Israel. Jesus later referred to her as a testimony against those who failed to recognize his divine wisdom. Solomon's global influence and prosperity are emphasized as kings from all over sought his presence to hear his God-given wisdom. Despite these blessings, Solomon's multiplication of horses and wives, contrary to God's commands, reveals a flaw in his character. Chapter 9 concludes with a summary of Solomon's reign and the wealth he accumulated. His reign lasted 40 years, and upon his death, he was succeeded by his son Rehoboam. God had fulfilled his promises to Solomon, granting him unparalleled wisdom, riches, and honor. Well, let's see what Rehoboam did. Now in chapter 12 of 2 Chronicles, we read that after Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. Yes, when he had become strong, he started abandoning the law of the Lord. Not only that, he got the whole of Israel to join with him, abandoned the law of the Lord. In the life of Rehoboam, one sin led to another. Now we see that he leads his people in apostasy. God did not approve of Rehoboam's conduct. People read the things these men did in the Old Testament and they say, look what they did and they got by with it. That is often said about Abraham when he took Hagar and had the boy Ishmael. Well, if we just look a little closer, we know that he didn't get by with it. He did get into a lot of trouble. Now God records the apostasy of Jeroboam. Also, he records the forsaking of the law by Rehoboam and Israel. God condemns these things, but he records them as history. Now, if you've got your Bibles, please do turn to Second Chronicles chapter 12. Now God's judgment falls upon Rehoboam. For the first time, he opens up that southern kingdom to the invasion of a major nation. You see, Rehoboam had forsaken the word of God. He had led his people in apostasy. When he did this, God did something he had not done before. Previous to this, God had put a wall around his people. And the great nations of that day were not permitted to invade that territory. Now let's read verses 2 and 3 of 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, with 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and the innumerable troops of Libyans, Sukkites and Cushites that came with him from Egypt. First, Shishak, 
king of Egypt came up and carried away great booty. He lugged away a, quite a deal of gold and other wealth of that kingdom. Now let's read verses 9 to 11. When Shisha, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem, he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including the gold shields Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shield to replace them and assigned these to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards went with him, bearing the shields, and afterward they returned them to the guard room. These, you recall, are the great shields of gold that David brought and that Solomon placed in the temple. After these had been captured as booty, Rehoboam substitutes these with something inferior. No longer do they have shields of gold, now they have shields of brass. The judgment of God is upon them because of their sins. This certainly was a humbling experience for Rehoboam. He had been brought up in the affluence of the reign of Solomon and had experienced the blessings that had come with it. He had known nothing but wealth, luxury and expected it to go on forever. Now he begins to realize that there may be an end to the glory of the kingdom of Solomon. Let's read verse 12. Because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger turned from him, and he was not totally destroyed. Indeed, there was some good in Judah. Doesn't this reveal the amazing mercy of God when this man humbles himself? God immediately withdraws judgment upon him and the people of Judah. Verse 13 King Rehoboam established himself firmly in Jerusalem and continued as king. He was 41 years old when he became king and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel in which to put his name. His mother, his name was Nama, she was an Ammonite. He did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. Now it is interesting to learn who Rehoboam's mother was. You recall that David had been very friendly with the Ammonites. Although they had made war against him, now we find that Rehoboam, his grandson, was the son of an Ammonite woman. She undoubtedly had something to do with the character of this man. You know, as we saw in the books of Kings, God always mentions the mother's name. Why? Because she bears part of the responsibility of her son. If he turns out well, she shares in the credit. If he turns out to be wicked, evil, then she must take part of the blame. Now the Acts, as for the events of Rehoboam's reign, this is verse 15, from beginning to end, are they not written in the records of Shemaiah, the prophet of Edo, the seer that deal with the genealogies? There was continual warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, and Abijah his son succeeded him as king. Yes, Rehoboam's chapter is closed and his son Abijah comes to the throne. Although Abijah is not considered a good king, the record in one king says that he walked in all the sins of his father, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. Yet here in Chronicles we read of an episode during which he honored the Lord. Let's read verses 3 to 6 of Second Chronicles chapter 13. Abijah went into battle with a force of 400,000 able fighting men and Jeroboam drew up a battle line against him with 800,000 able troops. Abijah stood on Mount Zemarim in the hill country of Ephraim and said, Jeroboam and all Israel, listen to me. Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever? by a covenant of salt? 
Yet Jeroboam, son of Nebad, an official of Solomon, son of David, rebelled against his master. Some worthless scoundrels gathered around him and opposed Rehoboam, son of Solomon, when he was young and indecisive, and not strong enough to resist them. Yes, Abijah recognizes his father's mistake. It says that he was young and indecisive and not strong enough. He was not only young and tender-hearted, but he was very foolish. Now here, Abijah is trying to win the other ten tribes by speaking and asking them to turn over themselves to him. This is the plea on the part of Abijah to try to bring back the ten tribes. But there is no use now because Jeroboam has made himself king and he is definitely not going to make peace. Now verses 13 to 14. Now Jeroboam had sent troops around to the rear so that while he was in front of Judah, the ambush was behind them. Judah turned and saw that they were being attacked at both front and rear. Then they cried out to the Lord. The priests blew their trumpets. They cried to God for help. Now notice God's gracious response. Verses 15 to 17. And the men of Judah raised the battle cry. At the sound of their battle cry, God wrote it, Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. The Israelites fled before Judah and God delivered them into their hands. Abijah and his men inflicted heavy losses upon them so that there were 500,000 casualties among Israel's able men. What a great victory! Verses 19 to 20. Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took from him the towns of Bethel, Jeshana, and Ephron with their surrounding villages. Jeroboam did not regain power during the time of Abijah, and the Lord struck him down and he died. This is God's judgment upon Jeroboam for dividing the nation. But listen to verses 21 and 22. But Abijah grew in strength. He married 14 wives and had 22 sons and 16 daughters. The other events of Abijah's reign, what he did and what he said, are written in the annotations of the prophet Edo. Abijah was no great king, but he definitely experienced strength and God's answer and God's victory. Now after him comes his son who will lead the first revival. And Abijah rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Asa, his son, succeeded him as king. And in his days, the country was at peace for ten years. During the reign of Asa, we will come to the first revival. I believe that God has given us a lesson on revival in this book. The road to revival is a rocky, unpaved, uphill road. However, the road is well marked. The road maps are pretty clear. There are certain bridges that must be crossed. Asa is one of the five kings whom God used to bring revival in the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom never had a revival. They had 19 kings and all of them were bad. There's not one good one in the lot way up there in the north. Of the 20 kings over Judah, 10 of them could be called good, but five of them were exceptionally good. These kings were Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Hezekiah, and Josiah. During their reigns, there was a period of reformation, which was incubated in a time of revival. There is a similarity among all of the kings, but there are also some striking differences. Asa is the first of the kings in whose reign there was a revival. Solomon was his great-grandfather. Rehoboam was his grandfather. And of course, Abijah was his father. Now verses 2 to 4. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. 
He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to obey his laws and commands. Here is the character of the man. He is absolutely outstanding. What is the first thing that he does? He smashes the sacred stones. He removes the foreign altars. Now, some of these stones, these foreign altars and sacred stones would have been put there by his forefathers and maybe the forefathers of the people of the nation of Israel. Now, it would have been quite a job trying to get those stones away because so often more than just those stones being thrown away, there is a lot of sentimental value attached to it because it's ancient stones, probably what the forefathers used to worship. So I wonder how he would have had to deal with the people when he actually had to go and remove those foreign altars. I don't think he would have been a very popular one, but he did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. Now I want us to just think for a moment. There may be certain things in our life which are around our homes, certain things that we have brought into our homes, they may be there for generations, but you know, heart of hearts, that this is definitely not of the Lord. Now, if it's something that belongs to you, it would be good for you to destroy these things. It could be images, it could be pictures, anything that is against God's will. I think that has to be removed. Anything that is against God's word, it has to be removed. Any practices, any magazines, any things that will distract us from God's word, that will take us away from Him, these have to be removed. I think it's so important for each one of us to do what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord our God. We may not be pleasing the people around us, but definitely, if we've got to please our God, we've got to take action and tough action at that. It may be hurting even us, but then we've got to do it. We've got to remove the foreign altars and the high places. Smash some of those sacred stones and cut down those poles. The things that distract us, the things that block our devotion to the Lord Almighty, those have to be removed. Dear friend, take action. Here is the character of the man. He is absolutely outstanding. Now verses 5 to 6. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. He built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. No one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. Because he took these firm steps, he experienced peace. I think a lot of us experience dispeace, or hurt or anxiety simply because we carry a lot of extra baggage. Dear friend, take the step of removing all of these things. You will experience peace, peace which passes all understanding, peace with God and peace with one another in your own home. Yes, dear friend, do what is necessary. You know what you have to do. Go ahead and do that. You will experience peace. Now let's read verses 9 to 10. Zerah the Cushite marched out against them with a vast army and 300 chariots and came as far as Marisha. Asa went out to meet him and they took up battle positions in the valley of Zephatha near Marisha. Not only was Asa a man of peace, but he was a man of prayer too. We have a glimpse into the private life of the king and it is commendable. Let's read the next verse, verses 11 to 12. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you and in your name. We have come against this vast army, O Lord, you are our God, do not let man prevail against you. This is real praying. It's not flowery, but direct, to the point, and it just tells the truth, just as it is. He says exactly what he means. 
Asa was a great man of prayer. The revival that came to the nation came because he was this kind of a king, a man who was committed to the Lord. Let's read from verse 13. And Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar. Such a great number of Cushites fell that they could not recover. They were crushed before the Lord and his forces. The men of Judah carried off a large amount of plunder. They destroyed all the villages around Gera, for the terror of the Lord had fallen upon them. They plundered all these villages since there was so much booty there. They also attacked the camps of the herdsmen and carried off droves of sheep and goats and camels. Then they returned to Jerusalem. What a victory! And yes, if you noticed, who was there fighting for them? It was the Lord. It was the Lord's battle. Yes, when we call on God, the Lord will fight for us. He will give us the victory. Dear friend, if we did notice here, Esau was, wasn't just a man of prayer who called on God when he was in trouble. He took drastic measures to set things right. He was a man of action. I think that's a balance that each one of us have to have. Yes, if we need revival, yes, we've got to pray. We've got to spend hours in prayer. But more than that, we have to take measures in order to right the wrong. We've got to live right. We've got to take action in our own lives. Yes, we've got to get rid of things that are hindering us. The sin that so easily entangles us. Yes, we've got to get rid of that and run the race that is set for us. And we will experience revival and victory. Yes, dear friend, pray. But also take steps of faith that will bring about great victory. Dear friends, Rehoboam's pride and self-reliance caused him to abandon the law of the Lord and be unfaithful to God. This departure from God's commands and faithfulness led to divine displeasure. The chronicler emphasizes that forsaking God, rejecting the temple, and worshiping other gods were at the core of Israel's unfaithfulness. The term unfaithful, exclusive to chroniclers, signifies Israel's constant estrangement from God, often culminating in national consequences like exile. Rehoboam's unfaithfulness parallels Saul's disobedience and anticipates Uzziah's pride, emphasizing the typological nature of his sins. Chronicles explicitly attributes Shishak's invasion to divine punishment for Israel's unfaithfulness, so casting the chronicler's consistent link between sin and national disaster, disobedience and blessing. While the Old Testament maintains this connection, Chronicler sharpens the emphasis. The New Testament retains the link, but shifts focus towards the afterlife and individual or church issues rather than national ones. Rehoboam's immediate punishment finds parallels in figures like Herod Agrippa I and events like Ananias and Shafira. But Jesus' teachings highlights judgment to come. While Christians may receive material benefits, Jesus emphasizes spiritual blessings now and in the future. God bless you. Mm-hmm.